Number one. I am a male and am now 30 years old. My family moved to the States when I turned 14, but I grew up in Russia in a small town called Kirov. It was big enough to house a full spread of criminal activity, from organized crime to cannibalistic hobos. These few stories are not tied together with anything else other than a cultural connection. Brief, absolutely true, and hopefully will give you a small glimpse of the state the country was in in the 1990s, right after the collapse. When I was very little, we lived in a typical Russian five-story apartment building in a, what would be considered, middle-class neighborhood. It was fairly quiet, with nothing much happening, so us kids could play outside for as long as we wanted without adult supervision. I remember a man living on the first floor of our building, his kitchen window overlooking the staircase which ran out onto the sidewalk. He was probably in his mid to late thirties, always wearing a dirty wife beater, never a clean shave. Every time it seemed, as I would walk or ride my bike by his window, he would be sitting there, sometimes a glass of milk in hand. He then would jump up from his chair and begin to yell and shout as loud as he could at me, swearing, calling me names, threatening. All of this he would do with excessive violent movements and facial expressions. As a four-year-old kid, I would just stand there in horror, watching him do his crazy, murderous acting. He would fall on his elbows on the windowsill and shake his head, feverishly spitting out curses and deathly threats at me, his eyes bulging. He would punch his chest with all his strength, and almost in tears of some deep rage would announce of his hatred towards me and how much he wished me dead. And if that wasn't enough, he would then pretend to be going for the door as if finally having found the resolution to go through with it, then coming back to the window and more shouting, more threats. I just remember never being able to stand to stay there for the horror that overtook me, and I would always run in the end, leaving the crazy man just staring at me out of his window. One day, he was just gone, disappeared. No more insane man in the window. Being a kid, I just moved on with my life and didn't think about the matter for years. Until much later, I told my parents about him and what he did for the first time. The story they told me confirmed my suspicions of his true nature. Around the same time as one of the last that I've seen him, a strange occurrence happened in our city. Body parts were found scattered throughout it, all far from each other, and all belonging to one unfortunate man whose wife plotted to kill him for the sake of acquiring his apartment and belongings. Her brother happened to be the freak living downstairs, who both violently killed the husband dismembering his body in a tub and distributed the pieces, including the head, all throughout town. Everything led to the wife, and it didn't take her long to blame the entire adventure on her dear brother, who, to this day, is sleeping in some dark cell, far away in the cold. When I was in 8th grade, my school started to have roof problems, it was an old building which used to belong to some merchant who lived back in the day of the Tsars, and every year it seemed to give more and more, until it finally gave a class full of students the ceiling falling on their heads. For the time it would take to restore the building, the student body would attend classes in public school number 22. I still remember it clearly a fortress of bad behavior bordering homicide. 
The students of number 22 mostly came from awful circumstances and enjoyed humiliation, severe beatings, just any kind of abuse. At that time, street fighting was also very common in the country, and the fights rarely ended with just a black eye or a busted lip. Broken bones, skull fractures, coma, and death were routine. One day, as my friends and I were talking in a hallway between classes, a big, bald kid came up to us with his entourage of hopeless degenerates. He told us how they had had enough of us and were planning to beat the life out of any boy from our school once classes were over. They didn't like us from the start because our school was considered preppy and they acted as if we were intruding on their territory. He told us they were all going to be there and it was gearing up to be a great show. We knew immediately he meant what he said as this guy held a certain authority in that dark place and most kids were afraid of him. He was one of those people who learned to swing at anyone who did anything as much as annoy him. And he wasn't alone. They were many. We told our teachers what he said, and they let us go secretly 20 minutes before the class was over. My friends and I all banded together as we got dressed for the winter day outside and left the school. The plan was to stick together and walk to the bus stop. I got on my bus and stood by the window. The route led right by the school and I would be able to see the courtyard in front of the main entrance and what could be happening there. As we were driving by, what I saw became etched in my mind for the rest of my life. On the white snow, in the clearing before the large doors of number 22, was an assembly of 200 to 250 mostly male figures dressed in black colors and forming a giant circle. In the middle of the circle I could see a fight underway. Just two of them, one with his arms thrown open as if taunting his opponent, and the other someone who did not look like they wanted to be there. This turned out to be a big operation on their part, as it looked like more were invited to what was being planned. I later learned that once they found out we left early, as the final bell rang, all of my classmates and I were already gone. They decided to beat on their own, and some poor kid was picked and beat so hard he ended up in an ICU. Since my school was very small in numbers, and some parents altogether decided to homeschool their kids for the time of the repairs, we would have had easily been outnumbered ten to one. I hate to think what would have happened if our teachers did not let us out early that day. On the next day, armed security was on the school premises and they stayed there until we were able to attend our old, but now dearly loved home of a dead merchant. Going back to a time when I was a kid, this last story is my personal claim to victory in the game of life or death, which happens to fall in our hands from time to time for no apparent reason at all. I was maybe nine at the time. We moved to a better area, more space, better location. Our apartment was on the last, sixth floor and the last one on the landing. It was the furthest you could go from the entrance of the building and fairly secluded. The staircase was also completely indoors, essentially housing anyone who entered in a climb, floor after floor, with four apartments to a landing. This day I came home from school around 2 p.m. My parents weren't due back home for at least three hours, and I set about doing my usual homework, watching TV, and emptying the fridge. It was around the time I settled in for an episode of Babylon 5, a plate with a bit of everything on my lap, 
that I heard the front doorbell ring. This was very odd, as my parents both had their key and no one else usually visited around this time of day. I went over to the front door and asked, Who is it? I heard a man answer back. Hi there. I'm from the electrical company. We're doing a routine check of the electric meters. May I come in and inspect yours? It'll only take a minute. I looked through the people and saw a young man, probably nearing 30, very clean, neatly dressed, with his hair combed to the side. He even held a clipboard in his hand with some papers attached. I was about to twist open the lock when I saw something. Because of the fisheye view I had on the landing, I could also see a little extra to the sides. On my left, the man's right, I saw light bouncing from what looked like a sharp metal object. Then for a second, I clearly saw what it was. The cutting edge of an axe. Someone was standing to the right of the door, attempting to hide from view, holding an axe. At this point, my memory gets blurry. I remember getting away from the door and creeping into my room, which was the farthest in the hallway, closing the door and not coming out until my parents got back. The bell kept ringing for a few more minutes, and then it finally fell silent. Number 2 Power outages in my two-story apartment were very common due to the fact that my apartment is shitty, so I was not shocked when it went off one night while on my phone. Little backstory, I was hearing strange shuffling and light footsteps upstairs, so I was a tiny bit unsettled. My brother Alex was out on the porch, so he wasn't really aware of the power outage. Anyway, what happened was it just went off. When I got up to go tell Alex, something came from up the stairs, speeding down, then almost sprinting down while trying to stay careful. I was scared. I dropped my phone. The only light supplied was the street light near my apartment that shined in from the window. I stood still the whole time to make sure whatever the thing was didn't see me. I heard footsteps around me, but nothing. My brother then waltzed in and asked what happened in a loud tone. Whatever was there sprinted towards the door, pushing Alex to the ground and leaving the door wide open. Puzzled, my brother got up and tried to chase after it, but it was long gone by the time he realized what just happened. Me and Alex moved out and now live in separate houses, but it still freaks me out sometimes when the power shuts off. Now, I don't ask any of you to believe me. I have no proof because me and my brother decided instead of calling the police, we call the landlord. Well... Strange creature that knocked my brother down and probably didn't have good intentions. Let's not meet. Ever. Number three. This is the story of me, my baby daughter, and an older Italian gentleman who became our guardian angel. Six months ago, I gave birth to a little girl, Clea. Her father and I were over the moon that she had finally arrived, but the process of getting her here was gruesome. I am a small woman, and she was a surprisingly big baby, almost 10 pounds. A very cute, precious, almost 10 pound baby, but it made for a hard delivery. Seven hours into labor with no signs of progress, meconium signs of fetal distress showed up and I was whisked into an emergency c-section we were finally sent home three days later with a bill of good health but my recovery was slow and painful I ended up having to take a much longer than standard maternity leave Clay and I mainly me slowly made our way to feeling good and about two months ago, I felt up to snuggling her into the baby sling 
and walking the four blocks to our yoga studio for a very simple mommy and me classes every Tuesday. The real treat was afterwards at the Dunkin Donuts next door where I would get a smoothie. Vinod is a 60 year old man who works behind the counter always telling me how bright I made his day. He loved seeing me smile, and one day I was going to have to ditch my rotten husband to come back to India with him. This was said in a playful context and wasn't creepy at all. He adored Clea. She's one of those babies that has rolls all over and was always saying how big and healthy she looked. Promise when she got old enough to eat real food he would give her as many munchkins as she wanted. The day Clea turned five months was a Tuesday. We headed to yoga and then to visit Vinod, who as usual cooed at the baby in Gujarati and gave me a free smoothie for being such a good mom at only five months, if he could see the state of my house. We said our goodbyes and I in a rare moment of absent-mindedness, decided I'm going to take the alley shortcut across the street to get to the block I needed to be on. It was such a bright day, the alley only a little shadowy, and it was less than 14 feet long. I didn't even have a concern in my mind, and I know that's incredibly, incredibly stupid. I made it past the garage cans when I felt something cold against my shoulder blade. Turning around, I saw a man with what looked like a stun gun pointed in my direction. Your wallet. Give me that. Give me your rings, your earrings, your phone. Anything of value on you is mine now. I didn't know what to do, so I started sobbing as I shakily reached for my shoulder bag. He pressed the stun gun into the side of my abdomen. Quiet. I'll use this. I don't care about the baby. I don't care about... I never found out what he didn't care about. Because the corner of my eye suddenly filled with a flash of brown, pink, and orange. It was Vinod armed with one of those handled trays the employees used to slide bagels into the oven. He got in one good hit, and the man was off like a shot. I'm shaking and crying. Clea is wailing, and Vanad, well, I was afraid he would keel over. Red, panting, and looking around all wild-eyed walk me back to the shop to call the police and my husband. Nothing ever turned up, but Vinod has my undying gratitude and appreciation for saving me in a moment of stupidity that went terribly wrong. Whatever major holiday it is, I don't care if he doesn't celebrate it, he gets a present from Clea. He deserves more than that, but I just don't know how to thank him to the degree he deserves. So, Ali Mugger, let's not meet again. And also, watch out for Vinod. Number four. So this happened to me about nine or ten years ago, but I will never forget it. At the time, I was about eleven or twelve. I was a competitive softball player, and my team was nationally ranked so we traveled all over the United States to play. This resulted in long car rides, sometimes through the night. One night in particular, it was about midnight and we were on our way to a tournament in who knows where. I had been sleeping in the car when we stopped at a gas station for a bathroom break. My teammate, who was also around 9 or 10, and I decided to stay in the car while our moms went inside because we really didn't have to go. A few moments after the moms had left, locking us in the car, I noticed another car in the parking lot. It was a few spaces over and was the only other car at the station at the time. I noticed a middle-aged man and a little girl who was about six to eight years old, who I assumed was his daughter because she looked strikingly similar to him, in this car. I met eyes with the daughter and she smiled at me. I smiled back and waved because she was adorable. 
The little girl then said something to the man, and he looked at me and smiled too. I went back to minding my own business as the man went into the store and left his daughter in the car. When I looked back at the little girl, she was looking at me with a scared look on her face. She started hitting the windows and motioning for me to come over to the car. Instantly, my adrenaline went into overdrive. This girl was really acting like she needed my help. My mind was racing. What if this man had kidnapped her and she needed my help? My initial thought was that he was her father, but you never know. I just had no idea what to do. I turned to my friend, who had gone back to sleep, and tried to wake her, but she just shot me a dirty look and went back to sleep. Turning back to the girl, I was about to get out of the car to go talk to her when I saw that she had made eye contact with the man in the store, who was just standing there watching through the window. He smiled at her and nodded, seemingly approvingly. She smiled back and then turned to me and instantly went back to trying to get me to come over to the car. After seeing that exchange, I thought something was off. It seemed this girl was acting at the direction of the man. I then decided I was not getting out of the car and would just tell my mom about it when she got back because, hey, I was aware that I was a little girl myself and what the heck could I do? Next thing I know, the man is returning to the car. He hadn't bought anything, and had basically been standing in the window watching the whole time. When he got in the car, they started having a conversation, occasionally glancing at me. Eventually, the little girl shrugged, and he kind of patted her on the shoulder. They started to pull out of the parking lot, and I glanced at the girl one last time, and saw she was looking right at me with this huge smile. I was so creeped out but didn't tell my mom when she returned to the car because I was still so confused and shocked about what had just happened. For a little bit, I didn't tell anyone, because I felt bad that I hadn't done anything when that girl could have actually been in trouble. But thinking back after I had gotten over the initial shock, I concluded that the man was using his daughter to try and lure me to the car by making me believe she was in some type of trouble. Who knows what would have happened next? But my guess is he would have run out from his watching spot and put me in the car and drove off with me. The creepiest thing is it seemed so orchestrated. I was sure this was not the first time they had done this. So, creepy man and his equally creepy daughter, let's not meet. floor of our building, his kitchen window overlooking the staircase which ran out onto the sidewalk. He was probably in his mid to late thirties, always wearing a dirty wife beater, never a clean shave. Every time it seemed, as I would walk or ride my bike by his window, he would be sitting there, sometimes a glass of milk in hand. He then would jump up from his chair and begin to yell and shout as loud as he could at me, swearing, calling me names, threatening. All of this he would do with ex- Number one. I am a male, and am now 30 years old. My family moved to the States when I turned 14 but I grew up in Russia in a small town called Kirov. It was big enough to house a full spread of criminal activity, from organized crime to cannibalistic hobos. These few stories are not tied together with anything else other than a cultural concessive violent movements and facial expressions. As a four-year-old kid, I would just stand there in horror, watching him do his crazy, murderous acting. He would fall on his elbows on the window sill and shake his head, feverishly spitting out curses and deathly threats at me, his eyes bulging. He would punch his chest with all his strength, and almost in tears of some deep rage would announce of his hatred towards me and how much he wished me dead. And if that wasn't enough, he would then pretend to be going for the door 
as if finally having found the resolution to go through with it, then coming back to the window, and more shouting, more threats. I just remember never being able to stand to stay there for the horror that overtook me, and I would always run in the end, leaving the crazy man just staring at me out of his window. One day, he was just gone, disappeared. No more insane man in the window. Being a kid, I just action, brief, absolutely true, and hopefully will give you a small glimpse of the state the country was in in the 1990s, right after the collapse. When I was very little, we lived in a typical Russian five-story apartment building in a, what would be considered, middle-class neighborhood. It was fairly quiet, with nothing much happening, so us kids could play outside for as long as we wanted without adult supervision. I remember a man living on the first floor.